What's your name? Oliver Bettis. Hi. And are you here at Oxford or are you? Fascinating. Okay. Yes, he's director of the Oxford Programme on Complexity Economics, which is part of uh, Oxford Martin School's Institute for New Economic Thinking. He's also known uh, for an early wearable computer for cheating at roulette, had directed a hedge fund for 12 years, and had been cited thousands of times for his work in chaos theory and complex systems. And now we're, and he's getting a chance to show the crossover between these topics, except maybe for roulette. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I have to make a small correction. We were not cheating at roulette. <laughs> we were predicting the motion of the roulette ball, which um, the state of Nevada subsequently ruled to be illegal, not while we were doing it. In other words, you are not allowed to predict the outcome of a game, to use a computer to predict the outcome of a game. And we did, but we did build the first wearable computers in the process. And um, so anyway, small correction. So I'm trying to um, steer a course. We've had some brilliant talks today. And uh, I'm hoping to be complimentary in the things I say here. So I've sort of pulled, been tuning my talk by pulling some things out, putting a few more things in, and we'll see how it goes. Let me just say on my title, I don't mean to say that risk control is a bad thing. I'm not arguing that we don't have to do risk control. What I'm going to argue is we have to be careful because the way we do risk control can generate systemic consequences that if we're not, well, that we need to try and minimize and we need to be aware of. Um, so I'm going to begin with a general discussion about systemic risk. 
I'm going to talk about specifically what drives systemic risk in markets, how to model it, and specifically say some things about agent-based modeling and the future of systemic risk control, particularly in, in financial markets. So um, I'm going to give my version of a definition of systemic risk. It emphasizes the collective aspect, that you have collective interactions of individual components that generate positive feedback effects that significantly alter pre-existing conditions at a macroscopic level. In other words, the interactions of the components change the environment those components are living in, amplify some disturbance, and you get a disruptive phenomenon that has negative consequences. I mean, um, although, as, we'll, as I'll argue in a moment, it may have positive consequences as well. So the positive-negative part is, can be debatable, but usually you mean, when you say risk, you usually mean something that at least immediately has negative consequences. Now, I'm going to begin by asking you, in your opinion, what were the greatest environmental disasters in the history of the Earth? And which of them involved systemic risk? Now, a few of you I know have heard me uh, do this test before. So if you, if you were in the audience from a previous talk of mine, uh, don't respond. But so, audience question. Um, what are examples of, of huge, and what, what are the biggest environmental disasters? And I'm talking about all the way back to the beginning. Yes. The great dying. The what? The great dying. The great dying? Which is the biggest uh, extinction in history. So which one is that? The Permian. The Permian? The Permian. Where possibly there was an unleashing of lots of uh, submerged gases which triggered a, a rapid change in the climate. Okay, I'll argue there's an even bigger one. But, but um, uh, um, yes, Ken? <coughs> Okay, so you, you may be right that I, I'm, I'm thinking of <laughs> since, since living things were around. But, but you know, that, that one, one more guess and then I'll, yeah. Uh, the, well, they're kind of changing the concentration of oxygen uh, via cyanobacteria. Very good. So you got my first one. I'm arguing that's the biggest one. <laughs> uh, the emergence of cyanobacteria 2.4 million year, billion years ago. Um, Right after that, there was the Huronian glaciation in which the world be became covered in ice. It's not, still not really understood whether the first caused the second or not. Um, but certainly that was a big event because what happened, these new critters evolved that released oxygen as a waste product and poisoned everything. And of course, without them, we wouldn't be here, right? So it's an example of good and bad. Um, is it a systemic effect? Well, it is systemic in the sense that it was spontaneously originated from the system without any particular external disturbance. But on the other hand, the systemic interaction element is maybe not so complicated, you know. They, they, they reproduce like crazy and everything else gets poisoned. Um, okay, another, um, well, a significant systemic event uh, the, the later on, 650 uh, million years ago, the Earth once again became covered by snow, by ice, uh, you know, 25 feet of ice at the equator. Um, it eventually warmed back up when volcanic activity kept building up. We had a huge increase in CO2 in the atmosphere, lots of global warming. We broke out of the snowball Earth phase. Of course, I should say the snowball Earth phase was self-reinforcing because ice reflects light really well. So once you're there, it's hard to break out unless you have something like lots of CO2 in the atmosphere to cancel it out. Shortly after that, we had the Cambrian explosion. Again, it's not known whether those are related. Um, systemic, don't know. Um, oh, by the way, I have my pretty picture of the Cambrian explosion. I mean, previous, there were just lots of single-celled things, and then suddenly you had multi-celled organisms. Um, the Cretaceous extinction, which may be the one you were thinking, okay, I'm not sure. So that's the one where the big, um, big meteorite um, hit, I'm now forgetting where it hit exactly. Near Acapulco. N yeah, near Acapulco. I don't know, okay. Big meteorite hit, um, you know, caused mass extinction of the dinosaurs, etc. On one hand, it's not an example of a systemic risk. I mean, some big thing whaps you from outside. I don't think a systemic, walking down the street and getting struck by lightning is not a systemic risk by, by definition. On the other hand, when you look at the consequences and what happened later, um, you know, it wasn't that the dinosaurs got hit on the head by the asteroid, it's that the asteroid threw up lots of junk into the atmosphere, 
Um, the world got quite dark and cold as a result and set off a whole series, a chain reaction of events that were systemic in nature. Um, so just to start out with a little bit of broad thinking about this. Um, I think whenever we have open-ended evolution, we have to worry about a systemic risk. Um, on one hand, and, and I, I want to make the point that controlling the environment's a tried and true evolutionary strategy. I mean, that's what, say, the transition to multicellularity was about. Uh, cells can much better control their immediate environment by linking up with other cells that participate in creating the environment they live in. Um, um, increasing complexity makes fitness increasingly endogenous through things like coevolution and niche construction. In other words, if your fitness depends on what all the other actors in the environment are doing, it may become rather hard to predict what's going to happen next and what the consequences of changes are going to be. Um, and in particular, when you have open evolution, forecasting relies on extrapolation rather than interpolation. And so you have examples where, as we saw in the crisis, uh, people set out to cre create new instruments for greater financial security that were designed to reduce risk, which then end up having huge systemic consequences that actually created risk. Um, just a few general observations. Innovation and risk go hand in hand. You can't have innovation without risk. You, um, I think the goal in finance is to, you're going to have to take risks if you want to make gains. The goal is to only take risks on the things that you're actually making gains from doing and to get rid of the other risks and to minimize the risks uh, in general, but you're never going to make them all go away if you want to make a profit. Um, um, there's also regulatory risk as we make regulations. What are the impacts of those regulations going to be? And I'm going to talk about that some here. I also just wanted to make a comment about unknown unknowns. I'm a great believer in emphasizing the, along with Donald Rumsfeld, of emphasizing unknown unknowns. But um, if you don't deal with the known unknowns, then you're just being stupid. And we're usually actually falling down because we aren't even dealing with the known unknowns, much less the unknown ones. So I'm going to illustrate uh, systemic risk in a dynamical context with an agent-based model uh, of a financial market. But it's motivated by an empirical fact that um, price returns have power law tails. And when I say it's essential for risk control, if, if you aren't um, taking that into account when you were doing risk control, you're, you're, you're really in trouble. Um, this was hammered home to me when at Prediction Company, we were, we were very much um, uh, <coughs> aware of this and thinking about our risk in terms of tail risk, uh, heavy-tailed risk. Uh, and we were in operation around the time of the LTCM disaster. Uh, we were making modest returns with you know, leverage ratios of 7 to 1. And um, around just after the long-term capital management uh, near disaster came to light, one of our junior guys was at a, one of these you know, industry conferences with one of their junior guys and sitting at the table, and he said, oh gosh, we just, got, we just had bad luck because we had a 25 sigma event. And our guy said, do you mean you actually talk about risk within your firm in terms of standard deviations? <laughs> and that's just a signature that the wrong culture was in place and, um, and was, I think, the prevailing culture at the time. Um, uh, particularly within, ac within academic, uh, ac well, maybe I shouldn't name names. Um, what? People still talk about that, but I think there's a much higher awareness of, of, of heavy tails than there used to be. Um, now, I also remember vividly a conversation in May of 2000 with Richard Roll, who's a famous financial economist, and he told me the problem of explaining the power law tails in financial returns is not an interesting problem. And I said, why? He said, well, first, we understand it, and it's trivial. And we, we understand it because we know that, that what markets do is um, we have uh, information coming into the market all the time. The amount of information that's coming in fluctuates. Uh, rational investors take that into account. And what's left over is volatility in prices. And, um, 
And the reason we have um, heavy tails is because we have periods where there's lots of information arrival and periods where there's not much information arrival. And you, you get a mixture of Gaussians. And if you take a mixture of Gaussians, you get something with heavy tails. And while I don't disagree with him that one can think about what's going on in financial markets as a mixture of Gaussians, actually, if he'd been reading the literature, he would have known that there was powerful evidence against that. And here I'm going to. Uh, quote a study by um, Cutler, Paterba, and Summers, and that Summers is Larry Summers, who later went on to achieve fame in other ways, um, famous or infamous, as your choice may be. Um, and what they did was actually, it's a very elegant, simple little study. They, um, they began by listing the largest 100 moves in the S&P index, and I, I'm listing the 12 largest here, over the period 1946 to 1987. They noted the date. They note the size, in the, well, I'm, I'm noting the size in this table. And then they went to the New York Times, and they opened the New York Times the day afterwards, and they read the New York Times explanation of that event, copied out a few phrases, and then went through and just subjectively decided, do these constitute real news? An example of real news might be Eisenhower suffers heart attack or outbreak of Korean War. These are things that came exogenously from outside the market and were clearly headline news. Versus things like, if you look at the biggest move, you see um, worry over dollar decline and rate deficit, fear of US not supporting dollar. To anybody who's traded in financial markets, those can't be news. I was worried and fearful every single day we had a position open in the market. And if your uh, manage, investment manager isn't worried and fearful all the time, you should fire him because uh, that's, that's their job. Um, uh, so it's striking that you see all these other things are mainly about emotion and mainly about internally generated market news. So I'm here amplifying a point that Didier made. There's a lot of internal news. There is also some foreign news. And by the way, uh, if you look at the fourth largest move, you see the decline in journalism. The New York Times actually had the courage to say there is no basic reason for the assault on prices. You'll never read that again. Um, um, now, let me just say, agent-based modeling has contributed to this dialogue by coming up with, um, with, with uh, an explanation of what could be causing all this internally generated market movement. Um, in particular, there are models using trend followers and value investors, so it's a kind of ecological model where you have swings in the population of these different kind of investors. Trend followers are inherently destabilizing, and so when trend followers get more active, you see higher volatility in the market. Um, so you have a proof of principle that you can generate events, extreme events endogenously. So I'm gonna go over a model that, um, that does this, but in a different way and without relying on trend following. So it's a value investor leverage model. Uh, we have now have two papers, um, uh, second one amplifying on a lot of the, so explicitly is doing some, uh, some regulatory testing. The model has four kinds of agents, although the most important one is the first one, the funds, which are value investors. I'll explain more what I mean by all of these. We have noise traders reverting to a fundamental value. So these are your ordinary investors who are kind of vaguely aware of fundamentals. And when things are underpriced, they're a little bit more likely to buy. When they're overpriced, they're a little bit more likely to sell. Um, we have investors choosing between the fund and cash. So in other words, they can either give their money to a, a fund or they can just pull their money out and keep it under their mattress or you know, put it in the bank, make a neg negligible interest rate. Um, and we have banks lending to funds. Here, or we, I, actually, I should say bank lending to funds. In this model, we just have one big bank. The bank never fails, has plenty of capital. I'm going to come back and revisit, talk about revisiting that at the end of this. Um, so I will now, um, let me just say a little bit about how the, how the value investors work. The value investors have a demand function that looks like this. If M of T is the mispricing at any given time, and I should have written a formula, but it's just the price minus the value. So if price is higher than value, the mispricing is positive and the asset is underpriced. In that case, the value investors buy the asset. And, and I'm also going to allow, so in other words, if, it, if zero is the reference point, the asset becomes underpriced, they hold more of the asset, they hold even more of the asset as it becomes more um, underpriced till they hit a limit 
where the bank, uh, well, let me actually say we're going to allow them to leverage. So let's consider, say, a five to one leverage. They can go up to about here without borrowing any money. Beyond this point, we let them borrow money from the bank. They borrow more and more money from the bank to buy more and more of the asset until they reach some point where the bank says, five to one leverage is enough. We won't let you leverage anymore. And at that point, their position flattens out. And similarly, on the short side, if the asset's overvalued, they can short the asset up, up to a limit. Um, now, uh, let me just think if I've told you enough about this model. There's a, another key thing I should tell you, which is we have heterogeneity in the, um, I guess I didn't say this here either. We have heterogeneity in, the, in, these ass, in these investors in that we allow some of them to be aggressive, which means they have a steep slope here, others to be less aggressive, which means they have a fairly flat slope. And so, in fact, what you see in this model when you run it is a kind of evolutionary experiment because now we have um, a variety of different types of funds ranging from very aggressive funds to not so aggressive funds. Um, and we see in the top panel I'm showing here, the wealth of the different funds as a function of time. You see there's periods where the funds grow and become quite prominent. Other periods where the funds, um, uh, for various reasons, don't grow as large. And these periods correspond, looking down here at the volatility of the market for that asset, to periods where the, there are periods where the asset can get very quiet, volatility becomes very low and other periods where prices move a lot and volatility is quite high. And if you stare at this for a while, you'll see this in this case is actually correlated with how strong these funds are. Now, why is that? It's because these are value funds. So when a value fund's operating normally, if the asset starts to get too far away from its value, the fund, if it's too far underpriced, the funds buy, which pushes it back towards its value. If it's too overpriced, they sell which pushes it toward its value. So you can have these regimes where um, the funds are actually quite successful at making the market fairly quiet. But then these regimes always end with a crash and then things become unstable for a while, volatility gets high, then you have these reestablished um, periods. You have the um, uh, great, um, sorry, now what, what is the name that Bernanke gives to this? Great moderation. This is the great moderation here, and you have turbulence in between. Um, now, I should say that during good times, evolutionary pressure favors the most aggressive funds. Why is that? Because as volatility goes down, they're by definition buying and selling much more aggressively. They make better profits than their neighbors. That both gives them better returns, so they accumulate more money. Um, they also attract more money from investors. They get big and they get lots of market power. Um, but it's precisely those funds becoming so dominant that ultimately triggers the crash. Um, let me just give you a few more uh, observations about what happens here. What I'm showing you here is a plot of um, returns. The probability of the return will be, it will be greater than some threshold R. So I'm plotting the log of that on this axis as a function of the probability that, um, sorry, as a function of the logarithm of R. So under a power law, this goes as R to the minus gamma. You take the logarithm, the minus gamma comes out in front, you should see a straight line. So what we see is in the red dots, we have what happens when we don't allow any of these funds to leverage. In the blue, we see what happens when we allow them to leverage with a maximum leverage cap of 10. And what we see is we're converted from a normal distribution, which we put in by design because we wired it into these noise traders, to a heavy tail distribution, which is what happens when we have the value investors present and leveraged. When the value investors are present and not leveraged, we end up with this. So we see directly that the heavy tails are generated by leveraging of these value investors by simply turning them on and off. And you can ask now, what, what's going on? Why, why do we see these kind of things? Well, when the mispricing is small, as I already said, funds are actually there lowering the volatility. So when times are good, they're making the volatility be small. Um, when that's the case, they drift towards using maximum leverage. 
And, um, um, but um, then when, they're, when, they're, when they have maximum leverage, when they get up here, what you can show is you have two competing effects. On one hand, when um, prices drop, leverage automatically goes up. On the other hand, when funds sell, they lower their leverage. So what happens is when they reach their limit, so they're going along, the mispricing is getting big. At a certain point, they say to the bank, I would like to take even more leverage. The bank says no. Um, in fact, what happens is if the price is, if, as the price drops, price dropping makes the mispricing even worse, um, they end up, they then have to sell to raise assets in order to pay back part of their loan for the bank. The bank makes a margin call. They're now selling into a falling market and they're now amplifying price fluctuations instead of damping them. And you're now, they're now creating systemic risk. Um, so this shows an example where you're in a quiet time before an, an event happens in which you have a massive buy-off and then you have or a massive sell-off because when one of the funds sells, that pushes the price down, which then causes leverage to go up even more, which causes even more selling. And so you get a snowball, a, a systemic event. And you get a crash, and then after the crash, you have high volatility again. So um, now, you know, I don't think this is a completely realistic account of what's going on in markets. Uh, though I think, I think there are instances where this is, this is very much what's going on. I guess what I meant to say is I think there are many, many things that are causing heavy tails, but um, uh, actually pushed by a referee who, who noted that, and maybe I should go back and show you this picture. In this picture here, we actually provide an inset to the actual VIX, which is an implied volatility index for the S&P, um, over about an uh, eight-year span. And there's a certain similarity to the kind of behavior you're seeing there. The background is higher, but the peaks have this characteristic asymmetric shape. And we realize that our model actually captures that moderately well. Here we show the behavior of the VIX. So we're plotting the, um, we took a, a several volatility spikes and we looked at the behavior around the spike and we see that, um, we see a characteristic power law buildup and decay during volatility spikes, which our model also captures, albeit with somewhat different parameters. Our, our buildup is not as fast, the decay is not as slow, but it's very different than what you see under a Garch model. I'm saying this just to illustrate that an agent-based model like this, well, this is not what I consider a fully calibrated and accurate agent-based model, can more or less automatically get certain features of markets right. I also want to make a side comment that um, things like clustered volatility, which is this clustered volatility, I should make it clear, is the tendency of markets to have uh, what we see here. We have periods of quiet, periods of, of lots of change, and intermittency and in switching between those. Um, clustered volatility, um, we've seen in another study I did with Tobias Gala where we just, uh, take players, adversarial players, we have them play a game, we just make up games at random. And we have them use reinforcement learning to try and learn their strategy for that game. And what we see when we do that, uh, we actually see a lot of interesting stuff. Sometimes we see them converging to equilibria, other times we see them converging to cha high dimensional chaotic behavior. There's very clear regularities and regimes in how that happens. Um, but what we see that's characteristic whenever they don't settle down to equilibria is that we see clustered volatility. So here we're plotting the change over one period in the total return to the players. And we're seeing, once again, just the spontaneous emergence of this clustered volatility. Um, now I wanted to make a comment before going on because D Didier raised a very interesting point in his talk about um, uh, when are large events caused by essentially the same mechanism as the smaller events, and when are they really caused by something fundamentally different? I have to say, I've always been inclined towards my, my I think an, a natural parsimonious default hypothesis is to assume that the mechanisms are the same. Um, but in many cases, maybe that 
isn't true. I mean, I, I was influenced by, I, I actually spent a summer in 1979 as an intern of Ed Lorenz. And I remember, remember him remarking to me that um, there's really no fundamental difference between, known fundamental difference between weather and climate. That is, there's variability over an hour scale, variability over a daily scale, variability over an annual scale, over a decadal scale, centuries, et cetera. And he says, if you look in the data, I've never seen any evidence of any clear break where you can say this is climate and this is weather. Though we do have a kind of useful nomenclature that somehow something that's really happening over long times is climate and something that's happening over shorter times is weather. But we have to ask ourselves those kind of questions in um, when we look at something like financial crises, we see events of many different sizes as we do in this model that I'm, I'm showing you here. So in a, in a plot like this, you see events of a variety of different sizes, um, crashes where the market lose ten, loses 10% of its value, 20%, 30%, 40%. You never really see anything much above 50% drop in price in, this, in the simulation, at least over the period we ran it. But in this case, we know there's nothing fundamentally different happening as we go across scales. Didier, I think, has raised an interesting point of we need to really get serious about ferreting out when we, um, when we, we see fundamental differences. Um, I think it's also important to stress that typically there are many different mechanisms at work. And as the scale changes, other mechanisms may kick in. And I think this is part of what you're arguing, Didier. Um, now, you can ask, to come back to the model I was showing you, um, so far I've shown you simulations with a fixed leverage cap. What if we regulate time-varying leverage used on, use, using, say, historical volatility, as has been proposed, as was done under Basel II, as is being proposed under Basel III? Um, what, what they propose is that, that um, you measure historical volatility over some time scale, like four years, and then depending on what that is, you, you have spreads that can depend on time for lending. So the spreads go up when volatility gets higher, or you have time-varying haircuts so that when volatility is high, you have to put up more collateral. When volatility is low, then less collateral. So that, what that means is that you end up with some time-varying leverage based on historical volatility. When historical volatility gets lower, lending gets higher, leverage gets bigger. Um, we also tested against uh, what we call the perfect hedge scheme, in which banks require funds to buy options to hedge their risk. So the bank just says, says I won't lend you any money unless you buy an option. And, and furthermore, if it fails, I get, I get the payment on the option before you do. Um, now, you would think that that would be fairly foolproof, but in fact, what we see is both of them behave quite similarly. And if you look at something like default versus leverage, so here we look at the probability of default um, for a fund as a function of the maximum leverage that the regulator imposes, we contrast three cases. The blue case, well, which we called unregulated, we really should have called it fixed, fixed leverage. So you can't take more than whatever Lambda Max says. The green is Basel and the red is the perfect hedge. What you see is for leverages of less than about a factor of 10, in fact, Basel or the perfect hedge reduce the um, probability of defaults. But when the leverage gets above a threshold of around 10, things actually get worse. Now, why is that? It's because the act of changing the leverage can actually cause people to be selling into a falling market um, and crash the market. So you can create dynamics that would not have been there without the regulation that actually make matters worse. By the way, um, you can look at other metrics and ask wh what's happening in them, like how do the investors in the fund do as a function of the leverage you allow and the regulatory scheme you impose. And what you see actually is a pretty complicated story with some fairly counterintuitive results because you, you can actually see that as the leverage goes up, the returns to the fund goes down due to systemic behaviors. Um, which scheme works better may depend on exactly which leverage regime you're in. Um, um, very clear tendency that as you 
uh, let the leverage be too high. Actually, the crippling cost of buying the options causes the returns to really get low. Um, now, you can ask, what do the managers prefer? Well, managers, maybe not surprisingly, they prefer no regulation because uh, they make more money in fees. Wasn't obvious to us that was going to be the case, but that's how it worked out. And banks, um, well, they prefer the perfect hedge because then the banks never take a loss. So, um, so I just want to point out that in this simulation, and I think this is the real world, there's no Pareto optimum. There's no magic point where everybody's better off. You have to actually make choices of whose welfare do you care about and what balance are you going to make. Um, I want to now make a few remarks about going beyond the model that I just showed you. The model that I just showed you was a model about leveraged hedge funds. Um, where the bank is kind of just a, a fixture in the background that's providing a service. The bank never fails because it has an infinite amount of capital. This isn't what happened in the crisis. The crisis was very much about banks leveraging, not about, fun well, funds leveraging also played a big role, but the bank leverage played a, a key role. So in the crisis model, um, we're, we're um, modeling really the key moving parts in the economy, in particular households, firms, banks, um, central banks. We're trying to actually get at the coupling between the financial and macro parts, uh, trying to make a tool that we can use for policy decision making, creating a series of models of increasing complexity that will create a kind of foundational software library, we hope. And we also hope that it could be something that would be useful for central banks. Um, the schematic of the model looks Something like this, we have, as I said, firms, households, banks, central banks. Um, the central bank can provide credit uh, to other banks um, or to commercial banks. Banks and actually all, all the um, actors in this model have balance sheets and um, uh, the, the operation of the model is very much about the, the rules that we put in, the agent behaviors for updating these balance sheets, the balance sheets describing the state of the actors in the market. Um, now, we, we have been, this is work in progress, asking the question of, do we see similar effects whereby endogenous risk estimation leads to instabilities in a world in which we now have banks making these kind of decisions? And so, in fact, I'll show you now a plot of a simulation, a preliminary simulation that um, done by Christoph Eimans, where we compare the upper case, where we assume that the actors have fixed perceptions of risk. They just, their risk aversion is set in stone and never changes, and it doesn't respond in any way to market conditions. So they're impervious to whether the market has been volatile or, volatile or not. And I think, um, so you can see there's some price ratios that are moving around in some stochastic way, and um, um, the returns from holding stocks pay a premium over um, lending money because we've built in risk aversion, the, taking into account the fact that stocks hold higher risk aversion. And um, on, the same, on a scale that I'm going to use below here, we look at the volatility in those dividends, and we can see it's extremely small. Now, what do we do? We change, we change the decision-making of the banks so that they now use value at risk to decide how big their portfolio should be. So they're going to use, when volatility gets low, they're going to they're increase the size of their portfolio. And when volatility gets high, they're going to do the opposite. And when we do that, we immediately see instabilities emerging where we see big swings and um, um, and these excursions are, again, not being driven by, well, they're being driven from trend following in the sense that your evaluation of past risk involves a kind of trend following because you're taking a moving average, but not directly tr trend following in the sense that you're doing anything that might be perceived as irrational regarding how you respond to fundamentals. So we're in the process of exploring this more, but we believe we're going to see similar kinds of phenomena to the one I showed you a moment ago. Because Didier um, mentioned the housing market, I want to just show an example of, of trying to understand the housing bubble. Um, it's another agent-based model with um, 
the collaborators I've shown here. I'm not going to say anything about, in detail about how this model works, other than just to say that um, we, we really try and model in detail the housing market itself. The, act, the main actors in the model are people who either householders who put their house on the market for sale or householders who want to buy a house. And we simulate their behavior under changes in exogenous conditions. Exogenous conditions are things like the interest rate, the demography going in and out of the Washington, D.C. area, because this is a model of just Washington, D.C., or lending policy. That is, bankers, during the course of this simulation, can tighten um, lending or loosen lending. And in fact, as we know, they substantially loosened. Len lending was quite tight in 1997 when the simulation starts. Uh, and leverage is uh, just the old-fashioned 20% down was by far the most dominant kind of loan um, to by 2006 when we saw a lot of loans that were made on very high leverages where very little was put down that had variable term interest rates and so on. So what we see is, first of all, we can match something like the Case-Shiller Index that Didier showed earlier. This is the Case-Shiller Index for Washington, D.C., where we see the data as a dashed line. The model is a solid line. The model you have to realize is, is responding to these endogenous changes. So we're not, we're not making exogenous changes. We're not making an unconditional prediction because the model is actually responding to changes in interest rates and lending policies that goes along. Um, so we see that we can do a reasonably good job of fitting things like the, how, the, the bubble in prices, the behavior of the number of units sold, the days on market. But then when we do a counterfactual, like we hold interest rates constant, we see the bubble getting damped out, or when we hold lending policy constant at 20% down fixed uh, interest rate loan, the bubble is substantially damped out. Um, now, I just want to say, maybe to wrap up this part of my talk, leverage, I think, is a kind of um, a tragedy of the commons. That is, in quiet periods, Everybody wants to outcompete the other guy, and, and, and we see this in our model, even though we, we, the agents themselves uh, don't make changes in what they do, evolution itself just selects the ones that are behaving more aggressively because they're producing better returns, and the investors all want better returns. Um, um, there's a, actually a famous remark, if you read um, Too Big to Fail, where I believe it was the chairman of Bank of America asks um, um, Hank Paulson, Hank, can't you do something to save us from ourselves? Like, like impose restrictions on what we can do. So <coughs> um, there are actually cases where even the market participants want these kind of spirals to stop. The regulatory debates have centered a lot on how to, how to manage leverage dynamically through things like countercyclical capital buffers and what leverage levels are right. And I don't think the answers that have emerged so far are very clear. That's the kind of thing we would like to answer more quantitatively in our agent-based models. Let me just mention, though, that I think one of the things that has not been properly brought to bear is something called the Kelly criterion, which actually makes, you know, it predicts that the right leverage level, uh, let me actually say a little bit more about this. Kelly criterion was based on a paper published in 1956 um, that was actually um, inspired more by thinking about things in terms of gambling and was specifically relevant initially to things like blackjack uh, and, and um, made its way slowly from the gambling theory literature via Ed Thorpe into the investment literature and Thorpe actually computed that under you know the idealized assumptions where you can get out of any bet instantaneously and where you have log normal behavior and you have no effect on the market, that the Kelly criterion just tells you what your leverage should be. It should be the mean return divided by the variance, which gives you a non-dimensional number that um, tells you what leverage to take. It, if you actually compute this, it gives numbers that are much lower than the numbers that are actually used by most investors. Um, yes. Um, it's, it is in that if it depends on whether you think of returns as having dimension or not. But time-wise, it comes out to be a non-dimensional number. 
we, we can argue this point after the meeting. I, I, I actually had initially the same reaction you did, but was convinced that it's non-dimensional. Um, um, so I just wanted to throw that in. Um, I wanted to also just make a comment that, you know, in, in economics, it's often assumed that we have, we, we all have some utility function that's built into us. Somehow we, we're allowed to all have different utility functions, but it's something that's just wired in and generally fixed in time. And then what we do, do is try and all act in order to maximize our utility. The Kelly analysis shows you that in any situation where you have an evolutionary scenario in which you have to do something in order to even survive, like for example, a poker tournament. In a poker tournament, if you don't make better returns than the other guy, um, you're gonna be eliminated because the guy who survives at the end is the guy who's finally made the best return. Um, um, that you really actually don't have a choice anymore about utility. You're forced to choose a particular utility function, which is log, re log return. And um, so, anyway, another side comment. Um, I wanted to make a few remarks about some of the papers we've done using network properties on systemic risk. In particular, um, several papers here where, with Fabio Caccioli as the first author. Uh, we, we, monitoring and measurement can play an important role in systemic risk. Uh, we have a proposal for what we're calling impact-based accounting where we argue, you know, you know, normally when people do accounting, they do it based on marginal returns. That is, you mark to market by looking at what's the last price something traded at in the market. You take all the assets in your portfolio, you mark them at that price, and you say that's the value of your portfolio. But anybody who's got a decent portfolio knows that's not the true value of their portfolio because if you actually had to eliminate, if you had to liquidate that portfolio, you'd start selling the asset. Selling the asset will drive prices down, so the price you'll actually get is going to be substantially lower than the mark-to-market price. So we're not the first people to make the suggestion that this kind of thing should be done, but we have a concrete suggestion for how to do it. And part of what we showed in that paper is just the act of marking your portfolio to market in a sensible way actually gets rid of a lot of systemic instabilities. Um, we've also looked at understanding the amplification of risk due to overlapping portfolios, which is one of the main um, vectors of contagion that uh, caused problems during the crisis in 2007 and 8, and looking at the interaction between different measures of contagion. Now, we've done this with network models that involve what I always think of as um, dominoes, where you knock one of the dominoes down and you see how many other dominoes it knocks down. I'm not gonna say too much more about this in part because the next speaker is gonna be Robert May, who, is, uh, one of, who was one of the originators of these kind of models, and, and we were very much following in footsteps here. I do wanna make a point, though, that these models and the models I just showed are strictly mechanical models and that we assume very simple fixed rules for the way the agents behave. All the action in the model comes about because of the mechanical process of how the agents influence each other from their dynamics and the mechanism of their interactions rather than from any deep thing about their behavior. And I guess I'm just gonna flick through those slides and not say more. This, this brings me actually to, um, I tried to think how I could contrast what I'm saying here from what previous speakers have said. Um, let me first just say what Didier said. Um, I think the main difference is that Didier, I see you as making a kind of quest to find fairly generic ways to understand systemic risk in lots of different systems, a very much a complex systems approach in that sense. Um, in contrast, I think the things I'm talking about here involve making agent-based models where you make an agent-based model that really tries to be fairly specific about the system that you're talking about and tries to understand systemic risk in that kind of context. I, I, I think both are actually a good thing to do. I just want to contrast the two approaches because I think it's one of the axes for approach and modeling that we're seeing on display here. Um, I also wanted to make a talk about the behavioral, a comment about the behavioral economics talk we heard. I mean, I, I believe behavioral effects are extremely important. I, I might agree with Didier, actually, that how one interprets these experiments is a bit tricky. I don't think 
it's obvious that the, the, the people are being non-rational by doing those things. I think it's very easy to confuse what the question really means and, and what the background setup is and um, so on. So I could make some quibbles, but I think those are quibbles. Uh, I do think that people are substantially non-rational and that's very important. But um, my main, I think the main thing we need to do as we get a better and better catalog of how people behave is to understand how to take that behavior and put it into models that now tell us things about the systemic consequences of that behavior, allows, it, allows us to see when those systemic consequences are coming from rational behavior or when they're, act, when they're coming from emotional or uh, irrational behavior. Um, and from that point of view, I see agent-based modeling and um, behavioral economics is going very much hand in hand because Agent-based models provide a simple testing platform to put in specific behaviors and see what their consequences are. Um, let me also say that I think it's often important to make sure that you're measuring those behaviors in contexts that are sufficiently close to the context of the decisions being made in the model that you know that you're going to get the right answer. It's not enough to just to say, well, people are overconfident. You have to understand how that will manifest itself in a specific situation. And in fact, you guys show the details matter can change little details and get very different answers from the players. Um, I now wanted to make a remark about top-down versus bottom-up control versus no control at all. Um, I want to con um, distinguish, actually I think I'm going to do this one first. Um, there's a tension between, well, I'm going to first make a contrast between Schumpeter and Keynes. So there's a tension between methodological individual and long-range growth on one side and controlling externalities and minimizing the societal damage of systemic effects on the other side. Um, so social preferences might be, do you care, I mean, is high growth at all cost what you want to achieve? Or are you willing to uh, live with arbitrarily sized bumps to get an average, uh, an on average bigger rate of return? Or would you prefer maybe a little bit slower growth, but having everything happen more smoothly. Well, we have to decide what we prefer as a society to make that choice. I don't know. But um, I think this is a situation where we don't know even the most basic things at this point about this. You know, Schumpeter would say, or, or let's say a, a trivial interpretation of Schumpeter would say that, well, you need these um, crises, you need these die-outs, you need depressions, because that puts stress on the system, it shakes things up. Um, you get creative destruction, it's good, it gives you better long-range growth in the, on the long run. Keynes, I'm, I'm caricaturing as saying, no, um, we actually can control these things and we can smooth the ride out and it's not clear that this has a cost. Um, it's also not clear at times that we know how to do that. But assuming we do know how to do it, it's not clear whether we can do it, is it possible to do it without a cost? I don't think we know the answer to this. Um, let me just give an example where I, I do think there are cases where we should be able to just win because systemic risk for stupid reasons is not good for anybody. Um, uh, if there is a trusted agency like the Office of Financial Research that has access to confidential information that can assess systemic risk, that can broadcast that information in some appropriately appropriate way, um, hopefully minimizing confidentiality issues. And um, then individuals can act on this information to avoid systemic risk. That seems like that would be a good thing. I mean, even something as simple, if it were accurate, as saying systemic risk is high today, back off, guys, uh, particularly if there's some regulatory teeth to making that happen, uh, that could be valuable. Um, there's a proposal called Debt Rank um, um, due to Stefano Baristan and et al. Um, that shows a way to rate institutions based on their um, uh, systemic risk from a network point of view. And one can then actually, uh, within the crisis framework, Stefan Turner and Sebastian Poledna have shown that, in fact, you can this, this works well, you can reduce systemic risk by simply having lending depend on what these debt indicators do. Um, 
I think when we think about reducing risks, I see two basic approaches. One is distributing risk, decentralizing them, decoupling them, tinkering with the rules to avoid the potential of positive feedback. And the other one is Keynesian style, you know, managing the economy macroscopically by providing a stimulus when we need stimulus and removing it when we don't need it. I don't think these are mutually exclusive, but um, I think if we can do the former, it's obviously more elegant and potentially, uh, I think, easier to achieve with less uh, serious effects. Um, we somehow want to find a way to maximize the effectiveness of the interventions we make um, that is minimize the size of the intervention we need to achieve a desired effect. Um, so it's my final slide here. So how do we um, avoid systemic risk in an ever more complex world? With a society, I think we have to learn to be better at understanding and simulating ourselves. I think we are not even coming close to making use of what we can do. I would argue if you look at the way we managed um, the recovery from the crisis, um, really what we did was uh, to use the good old method of analogs uh, based on what had happened in historically similar situations. That, what do I mean by method of analogs? And method of analogs means you go back through the historical record, you find a situation that seems to be fairly much like the situation you're in at the present, then you take advantage of the fact that it's history, you look forward a few days, and you see what happens. I mean, as an aside, um, uh, up until 1980, weather was substantially predicted using the method of analogs. Um, I actually remember, again, I learned this from a conversation with Ed Lorenz at the time, because it was, it was 1979, which was about the turning point. I asked him, Ed, are you guys with your computers able to beat um, the, the, guys, the guys that just stroke their beards and kind of say what they think the weather will be? And say, well, we're just about holding even with them now. We'll beat them soon. And he was right. By the way, the way these guys used to predict the weather is they would have a big book of weather maps. They would look through the book they would look at the weather map for the day, they would remember these weather maps, and they would find a similar weather map, and then they would just look forward for a few days, you know, adjust it for the wind direction and speed, and make a forecast. 1980, physical weather prediction passed that, and now it's far better than that method. But it took 30 years from the first uh, computer simulation of weather in 1950 by John von Neumann till 1980 when they actually got better to do it. Um, so in weather, we are making use of Moore's law, and as a result, we have better, better weather forecasts. In economics, I would argue we aren't doing that at all. We spend far more on polar exploration than we do on economic research. I think we need to make serious attempts to make the kind of agent-based models that we're trying to make. I think um, lots of other groups should be funded to do this and compete with us, because I, I don't want to claim that you know, we're going to make the greatest model, but I think ultimately that's the way um, economic risk need to be predicted and um, um, is the future of, of how these kind of things will be done. And so on that note, I'll close and I hope I've left, I have left time for questions. So. Yes, we have about 10 minutes uh, now time for questions. So, any questions? Okay, let's see. You first, Ventadir. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm just interested in the bottom down and top, no, sorry, top down, bottom up um, differences. Um, and looking back at the agent based model that you had compared with the, the Garch model, and just wondering how much of that is due to if you had put some nonlinearity in the Garch model, so you'd looked at the leverage effect. Would you then have got some profiles that were similar enough to sort of be very difficult to sort of take the difference between that and the agent-based modeling? So I'm just, is that the kind of parallels that you were kind of referring to at the end? Okay. Um, so two things. Let me say, I, hearing Didier's talk, I'm wondering, well, maybe if we use that kind of model instead of a Garch model, you would see some more as, of, of that asymmetry. So you do. Okay. 
So I do think one can make models that capture that better, that are very simple, you know, empirical time series based models. But in talking about top down, bottom up, I wasn't really uh, trying to make that distinction. And let me try and make two distinctions. One is between method of analogs. Time series modeling, statistical modeling is essentially, usually in some form, the met method of analogs. You take some past stuff, you know, you fit, you fit a model to it, and you assume that the future will be like the past. And versus in an agent-based model, you try and actually understand a more, at a more fundamental level, you try and create a description of what you have that um, you might hope could actually extrapolate to situations you haven't seen before. So that's one axis. By top-down, bottom-up, I meant that in terms of control, um, in a, with an agent-based model, you can play with changing the rules of the game. You can say, as a regulator, we pass a rule that people can't have to use less leverage, or they have to um, hold back a countercyclical capital buffer. Um, versus, okay, we're in this circumstance now. Let's change the leverage, or let's, you know, do quantitative easing. I see that as a top-down kind of control because you're essentially taking the whole system at a macroscopic level, applying big controls, versus saying to the players what the rules are, which then percolates from the bottom up. Do you see any precursor of the big crash in your model? And also, I was uh, interested by look, um, observing that you don't put the government. You have the firms, the household, the banks, and so on. And in your quest to replace you know, economic decision and beat maybe the dynamical stochastic general equilibrium models to, to make the analogy with uh, Ed Lorenz's quest to, to have the prediction of, of, of weather. So why did you uh, leave the government out in yeah. order to replace you know, agent-based model? Uh, using agent based model to replay the, the standpoint. Yeah, so, so that's, we, we, we're doing things in a series of steps, and uh, small steps first, I guess. Um, so we do have the central bank in there, which is a key government player, and actually we have the government entering in a very side thing at the moment because the central bank can both do um, things like Taylor rules, where it controls the interest rate. It can also do um, uh, non-standard policy actions where, for example, it, it it, when there's a default, it has a protocol for putting the institution that's gone through the default back on its feet. One, one of the protocols can be just let it fail, but it can also, we have a bail-in mechanism, we can have a bail-out mechanism or purchase, purchase an assumption mechanism, and to do those, we actually go tax the households in order to do that. Down the line, the government's going to play a bigger role because taxes will become a routine thing and so on. I'm, I'm really just showing the model as it is now. Yeah, yeah, so that's the goal, but again, we're just taking steps one at a time. And on the precursors of the crash in your model? The pre I wouldn't want to stretch that far to say that we could do precursors of the crash. I hope with this model, I mean, I'm really talking about two models. The, the earlier one, which is well-developed, two published papers now. You don't see precursors? I haven't, we haven't tried. We haven't tried to track through the history. We do, we do actually, let, let me, let me, let me answer the question a little bit differently. In the, in the model I emphasized here, the hedge fund, leveraged hedge fund model, we do see some precursors, and then if you look at things like the leverage, you see the leverage drifting up. So you do see, I think, some of the kind of creep that you were talking about, where you go along, everything looks pretty good, you're still having a great moderation, everybody's pretty happy, nobody's failing, but meanwhile, leverage keeps creeping up and creeping up, and then there's some event that causes the big snowball to fall and the crash to happen. So in that sense, there's, there are precursors. I think, you, I think a regulatory agent watching that model would be able to put up a little warning sign, things are getting more dangerous, guys, look, look out. So in that sense, we see precursors. Now, the specific crash of you know, 2008, well, we're, we're not modeling things in enough detail to do that. Well, thank you very much. Uh... You're welcome. And for our final speaker, uh, 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 I would like to present uh, 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 Robert May. So he lived a um, double life, both as a professor of zoology here, but also as a member of the House of Lords. And I've been told that he actually gave up a me meeting of a select committee of economic affairs for this meeting, which uh, makes me feel deeply honored. 
So he's been president of the Royal Society from 2000 to 2005, and he is head of the Office of Science and Technology from 95 to 2000. So there he would direct the UK's Office of Science and Technology. Perhaps uh, more importantly, he invented theoretical ecology. Uh, so I vividly remember encountering a paper that blew my mind. And then I realized, wait a minute, that was written the same year I was born. It demonstrated that, oh, in, in, uh, there is no such thing as the balance of nature. Uh, actually, it, it, uh, and then I later on realized, oh, and that was uh, 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 Bob who wrote this. So he's been applying a, a mathematical understanding to the stability of in ecology. And then it turns out, of course, that this mathematical understanding also allows you to say sensible things about our economy. So he's been collaborating with Andy Haldane, who, whose name's been coming up a number of times today, uh, and others to describe and combat systemic risk in the banking system. So his uh, talk will be about complexity and the risk to the banking ecosystem after the, a brief uh, pause where he's getting suitably wired up. Okay, the, uh, <laughs> the talk is rapidly attaining the status of a sort of afterthought, but he, here we go. Um, what I'm uh, aiming to talk about, uh, let me just, uh -huh, I've got a more sophisticated PowerPoint than I thought I had. Um, I'm going first to say a little bit generally about complicated networks and their resistance to perturbation. And from that I'm going to move to say a little bit about some common sense and also some slightly more technical comments on how derivatives came to be so grossly mispriced. And what is really puzzling about all that is that wise people were aware of that early on and it just seems to me rather strange that not more notice wasn't taken of Warren Buffett's uh, actions in 2002, um, which I will touch on. Um, and just with straight common sense, you sh if anyone who hasn't read his letter to investors in Barclay Hathaway um, 2002, when he'd taken over an insurance company that had a lot of derivatives, and he was explaining to the, uh, his uh, people who invested in him um, why he'd got rid of them. And it's just in plain English, very simple, uh, and it actually uh, it says some interesting things about elements of the uh, economic community uh, that nobody took much notice of it because it didn't seem elaborate enough, I suspect. Anyhow, I'm going to indulge uh, a certain amount of polemical uh, wittering at that point, and 
Then I'm going to go on to talk about some of the things I have done in collaboration with Andy Haldane and uh, some other people, mainly Sujit Kapadia, who's also a very bright young thing in the, uh, in the Bank of England, and uh, things that are, and, and uh, Nim Arinampathy, or Nim Pathy for short, uh, who is a was graduate student here, very, very able person, still agonizing now about whether his career is to be in epidemiology or in um, this sort of stuff, and he's compromising for the meanwhile in doing both. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about regulatory implications of all this. So it begins, I sorry, apologize for people who've heard me say this before. Oh, and incidentally, if there are anybody in the audience who was um, in the, related to the Oxford Mann Institute, I'm giving a talk there at lunchtime tomorrow, which is made much the same talk, so don't come to it. <laughs> yeah, I, I got accidentally drawn into an interest in ecology um, mo before most of you were born. In the late 1960s, it was an epiphenomenon of the Vietnam War, which um, the person who was the co-author of the world's leading ecology text of the day, and who also believed that mathematics had no part in ecology, but also was a very, very good human being. And uh, he drew me into this thing as uh, social responsibility in science, and I was finding out what I was being socially responsible about, and I came across this thing that uh, ecology being a young word that's only been around for about 100 years, the first 50 years, I mean, the British Ecological Society is the world's oldest ecological society that celebrated its centenary last year. The first half century was mainly descriptive, and it was around the 50s, 60s that people were beginning to think theoretical. And one of the uh, conjectured fundamental rules was that complex ecosystems with more species and more connections would be more resistant to disturbance, and I found that implausible. And I actually thought about it. Um, this, it was based basically on a misunderstanding, I think, of a paper that Robert MacArthur, one of the really influential people in the early days of ecology. Um, and I thought, well, let's think of a toy model and see whether it does this. And let's suppose we've got n species, each of which would be stable if it left to itself. So I'll denote that linearized thing of minus ones down the diagonal of a of a matrix characterizing characteristic return after disturbance. And, uh, and now let me start, having started with that, where every species is uh, going, if it increases beyond its average, it'll decrease next generation and conversely. Um, now let me start throwing in interactions among them, more or less at random, plus or minus. So plus plus would be mutualists, minus minus would be competitors, plus minus would be predator prey. If the pluses and minuses were at random, predator prey would be twice as uh, common, of course, as the other two, and uh, with some average strength. And uh, look at that, and then one was able to pick up and generalize a theorem that uh, Wigner had uh, made to show that asymptotically for very large numbers of species, that system would remain stabilized by the intraspecific mechanisms, provided the number of connections and their square on their strength wasn't too big. But once the average number of connections per species and the square on the strength exceeded unity, uh, bits would begin to fall off it, as it were. Now that, of course, what that did, and we're still on the journey, what that di did really is redefine, reset the agenda, because that's all right to say, what if you do it at random? But real ecosystems are not randomly, because they are the winnowed products of thousands, hundreds and thousands, millions of years. And so their structure may tell you if you look at it and try and, uh, so it reset the agenda of trying to understand the relationship between what you actually see and what might be things that reconcile exploiting all the niches that are there and creating new niches, the sort of evolution that produces species-rich uh, systems, and reconciles that with persistence. And I'm not going to dwell on that any further, uh, just to, I think, a, to 
I couldn't resist mentioning it. It's what drew me into this accidentally. Um, and the fact that basically there may be something in that I find reassuring by some very nice work done by people at the Santa Fe Institute, which I always uh, like to mention the Santa Fe Institute when Caccioli is here, and where I first met him, and Doyne, whom I, company I very much enjoy, so I mention that, and Jennifer Dunn, really super person, and they found that necessarily imprecisely inferring the structure of the food webs that are in the Berger shale um, are very similar to the predator-prey ratios you see today. Now with all that behind us, one got to remember anyhow, when I show you a diagram of who's connected to whom, if, when, when I tell you a degree distribution of how many people have lots of things, when, when I tell you, for example, it's a scale-free distribution, if I did, which I wouldn't all that often, um, that doesn't really specify entirely what's going to happen when you mess around with it, because it really depends within the degree distribution who's connected to whom. And in particular, you need to know its connectivity structure to understand how things go on. And this is a study that I did with uh, Roy Anderson and Shanetra Gupta, a very good epidemiologist and also a, a very prolific published uh, author of novels. Um, it is looking at, in, in the background being, trying to understand HIV better, and it's looking at an epidemic spreading in the conventional way, but where the web of connections is disassortative in the sense that the people with lots of partners tend to pick on people who have few partners. Or assortative, in which the people who have lots of partners are tending to mainly be interacting with people with lots of papers and the, pa pa with people and the sort of partners, the sort of shy partners are looking for other shy people, as it were. And in the middle somewhere will be something where it's just proportionate that the number to the to the number of connections you have, but it's neither disassortative or assortative. And they have very different epidemiological histories. If you want to design a system that infects the maximum number of people you wanted the assortative thing, where the very active people are interacting with the less active people. And if you want a system that burnt that, you want the disassortative thing for that. If you want the system not to have so many infections, assortative systems are quite helpful in that regard. And they do have thus dis different dynamics. I got drawn into this accidentally by uh, George Sugihara in that George Su Sugihara published a, and I published a paper on the flip side of chaos in 1990, which said, you know, chaos tells you you might know all the rules exactly and there's nothing de random in the system. It's completely deterministic and you know the rules, but if the system is sufficiently nonlinear that it ca behaves chaotically, you can make predictions within a horizon, of the Apanoff horizon, but not long-term predictions. It's the sort of end of the Newtonian dream. But the flip side of that, which is not as appreciated as often as it might be, is that if you see something that looks random, it may be that it is, in fact, deterministic chaos. You still won't be able to make long-term predictions, but it opens a new window on a way of making short-term predictions because you can just make, for this phenomenon, a library of past patterns, and then you look in the library for the past patterns that were most like what you just saw, and there'll be a good guide to short-term predictions. And George parlayed that into running Deutsche Bank Securities USA for four or five years, and making an absolutely obscene amount of money. And then, being George, he decided he much preferred being in a university and he went back to working on fisheries because he had more money than he was going to need in several lifetimes. So, very presciently, in 2006, before there was any evidence that things were... Well, there were, before there was no agreed evidence and alarm that things were going to go pear-shaped, 
Presciently, the US National Academy of Sciences and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York put together a study group to address the question that maybe all these things that were going on, all designed in the interests of individual institutions to try and maximize profits with minimum risk, what was happening to the system as a whole? And they drew in people from outside the financial system, and George was a natural because he worked on lots of other things, but he had also run Deutsche Bank securities for several years. And in fact, interestingly, George's main contribution to this was to say, well, it would be nice to know the, how the banks are connected, who's connected to whom. And this is an obviously uh, oversimplified diagram uh, some nine and a half thousand American banks, and it turns out that some 60 of them account for a very disproportionate volume of all that. It, it, it is an extreme disassortative connection, which is to say this natural banking network in the States is ideally designed uh, to be most efficient at propagating disaster. And I'm not sure that this message has uh, received quite as much attention as it might if people... By and large, there is a bit of a tendency in the network community to think all you need to know is the degree distribution. Now, I want to go on and just say a little bit about financial derivatives, and in doing so, I'm really talking entirely about a very interesting group, um, one of whom is in the audience, um, who were at that time all together in Trieste. Uh, basically, um, this is, I, I lifted this and I'm not going to read it for you, you can read it. Um, and they're just quotes lifted from a paper that uh, Joe Stiglitz and some of the people at Zurich and some of the people at the LSE wrote. They're, and they're emphasizing that their financial contracts that it's hard to see what the market is because they're over the counter and there isn't a lot of knowledge about exactly what they're going on. If you look in, if you make a plausible model of what was going on, and this is the Caccioli et al. model, it turns out, that, and it's a beautiful calculation too, it's one of the hairiest things I've ever seen. It's a, a sort of variant in effect the actual mathematics on the, the icing model. I do have the rather unkind feeling that a lot of mathematics in, e in economics, as I see it, is there more for decorative purposes. But this was uh, sort of physics envy, as it were, uh, which seems to have spread from biology to uh, other things. Um, this, uh, when you look in detail, at what is going on in a web like that, you discover that as things progress, eventually there is a collapse of the system. What we've actually seen, and the next slide I'm going to show you is my favorite slide, and I think it has many messages. This is something produced by the people at the Bank of England, and it is a plot of UK bank assets as a ratio to UK GDP. How many people have seen this slide before? People have come to my seminar. <laughs> yeah. That's a fascinating thing. For a century, from 1880 to 1970, that ratio of bank assets, normalized for inflation by dividing by GDP, fluctuated about 0.5, 10 or 20%. Around 1970, and I am unaware of any literature asking why did it start to go up then, 1970 is around the time when I, my PhD thesis was the first big calculation on the first mainframe in Australia. It was around that time. It left me, I should say, with a lifetime ambition never to deal with a computer again <laughs> other than through the medium of graduate students. Uh, hence. Uh, Hence George Sugihara and, uh, and then Empathy and so on. But it, it climbed. It didn't exponentiate at Moore's law rate. But how any regulatory corpus, or how even the people who were doing it, could have not been aware that this was happening? And just before the crash, 
it had climbed to eight. That is to say, it was saying that the ratio of UK bank assets had increased by a factor of 16, normalised against GDP. What is really happening, of course, is that you had an asset, mortgages, and then you sliced it and diced it, and you counted it again, and then you traded it on again, and you counted it again, and uh, the, uh, the, the Chancellor and Gordon Brown was very happy because lots of people were getting obscene bonuses, and so he was getting a lot of tax revenue, and so everybody seen this was a very interesting. I'm going to come back to that because in, I think that should have been a warning sign, a very unsophisticated but clear warning sign, and we're seeing it again. And I will come back to that in a moment. Um, I've missed today the Economics Affairs Select Committee in the Lords meets on Tuesday afternoons, and we had the bank of, current bank of, governor of the Bank of England in the other day, and I was a little um, um, worried about one of the things he said in, this con in the context of that slide I just showed. The analysis in that Stiglitz et al. paper was, I, this really belongs more toward the end, but it pointed out that simply creating a market in this and having it not traded over the counter but in a more transparent way would be a major regulatory reform that might be helpful. I'm going to skip through the Warren Buffett stuff, um, but I just love that quote, and as I say, we've, I've already discussed that. It draws, the, the, insofar as there is a theoretical base of pricing these things, it draws from this wonderful mythological landscape. And I am in the habit, increasingly and rather unkindly, saying the more I learn about economics, the more I feel that the mode of discourse would be more familiar to Socrates than to a post-Enlightenment physicist. Uh, people have ideas about how things work. Our current government has ideas about how markets work that they've been taught in, uh, here in Oxford, most of them, <laughs> in PPE, which is a subject that has essentially no substance at any... I mean, it's philosophy, which is fun, and, and it's politics, which they're interested in, and it's economics. And here is a good, much better characterization of economics that I just, that in fact, my wife came across reading. Uh, this is, Skidelsky is an extremely distinguished economist who's just written a wonderful three-volume biography of John Maynard Keynes. And that uh, in the first, uh, in the volume that summarizes, there's a shorter three, ver puts them all into one book, <laughs> on page 23 of the introduction, is what I think is a very interesting uh, genuflection in the direction of explaining why some of these things, why somebody could seriously believe that if you put to big, uh, together big tranches of triple B mortgages, there'd be triple A by waving the magic wand of the central limit theorem over them, in effect, though concealed along a lot of seeming technicality, when in fact, you could, if you looked at the data, you could see they aren't Gaussianly distributed. Another thing I recommend to you, but I'm not going to dwell on in the interest of time, um, if you Google the financial bubble, best bubbles, or you get there's some very amusing things. And these are the top six of all time. And I was rather perturbed to discover that Romanian property bubble uh, is right up there sort of with the South Sea bubble, which I find implausible but interesting. However, what I, the direction I was really heading in uh, was this one. Um, <coughs> I have to remind myself what, what I wanted. Yes, this uh, what this uh, slide is showing is for the thirty banks or entities that had the highest volume of derivative contracts um, through this span of time. So part of it is the two thirds of it is showing up on the red slide we had earlier. Except here it's broken out by institutions. Uh, George Sugihara had left Deutsche Bank uh, way around sort of 2001, and I don't think that was prescience over what was going to happen, but that it is interesting. But what is interesting about this is 
having seen that spike, recognizing the behavior that caused it, I find it odd that when the current governor of the Bank of England was asked uh, what would, how did he feel the next few years were going to be, he said, well, he thought we were, the problems were behind us and it was pretty encouraging because the ratio of bank assets to um, GDP was about four and it looked like it was heading on up maybe to around eight or nine. And he found that reassuring. And I thought uh, this was, that was not the forum in which to say I didn't understand why it was reassuring. Uh, I, I find it unreassuring uh, in a very unsophisticated way, it seems to me that one is not discouraging risky behavior and one is not showing one has learned much when you see the same phenomenon that the bubble bubbled and then it burst and now people are getting all cheerful about the fact that there's another bubble coming. So now I'm going to change gears altogether. That was, instead of inflicting on your opinion and stuff like that, I'm going to talk about the stuff that uh, Doyne said I would talk about. And I was going to talk about it anyhow. <laughs> Doyne knows me well enough to know I would have. Um, when I first got interested in this, I th my first thought was, well, but they're, not, they're like ecosystems and they're not like ecosystems. In ecosystems, you know what the nodes are. The nodes are a species. And you know what's happening with the connections. Either they're, eat, they're connected by, to another species by eating them, or they're connected to another species because another species eats them, uh, or maybe they're cooperating, or maybe they're competing. Whereas in a bank system, I'm going to have banks, the nodes in the banking system are going to be very complicated. And it's always been my habit, that, good or bad, that when I get into something new, I don't begin by reading up all about it, because I figure if you try and learn what is the conventional wisdom, it's going to channel what you think about. So I tend to think about what I would do, and then I go and read up the stuff. Um, and, that's, and I really read it. A great deal of the stuff in this general area of complex systems um, has the habit, which I find very irritating, of citing things which they clearly haven't read. <laughs> but I digress. It's particularly the case when they refer to parallel epidemiological work. Anyhow, I thought a node has at least four kinds of things going on. Two kinds of stuff coming in from the external world and things coming in from within the financial system, borrowing. And two kinds of things going out externally and internally. And then I talked to Nicholas Beale because I wanted to uh, find out was, did this make sense? And Nicholas said, no, that's much too simple. And I talked to the people at the Bank of England and, uh, and they said, that's much too simple. And anyhow, there's a very nice model that we've just done. And it was this model, <laughs> which I, get, I found very reassuring. Uh, basically, it's the first thing I looked at with NIM. And I, we said, each of the nodes will have a system with a given number of banks, and each of the banks will have deposits and borrowing, and it'll have external assets and interbank loans. And one of the rules, of course, has to be that the assets exceed the liabilities, so you've got a little cushion of reserve and net worth, call it what you will, I like to call it gamma, um, and so that your assets exceed your liabilities. Then look at what happens if you wipe out some of the assets in such a way that they wipe out the net worth and have more wiping out left over. And in this model, that is then distributed among the creditors, so it'll be attenuated at each step, but you can ask how such a thing will unfold. The model that the bank had done was done with computer simulations and I was able to recapture the, some, by doing a mean field approximation, I could get something more or less indistinguishable from the computer simulations, but I could ask a wider range of questions. And one of them I asked was, without any knowledge of, of Glass-Steagall, um, if we had these shocks, that was just a big shock being propagated, but attenuating each time because it's divided among more banks each time. 
And so I start by saying the, the triangle 0, 1, F, <coughs> what we're looking at up that, ex, at that axis is the proportion of the assets that are in interbank loans from 0 to 1, and the rest are external assets. And I'm looking at it also against the magnitude of the net worth, gamma. And so the triangle 0, 1, F, F is a, an, a, a shock of magnitude that will cause the bank to have to, 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 to fail. And then one looks for the next phase, the second phase, what will happen, how small does the net worth have to be in order that that shock propagated though attenuated to the connected banks, causes them to collapse. And what shock will cause them for another phase and so on. But the interesting thing is that out of that trivially simple model, uh, you find that if you really want to keep the system fragile, you want a sort of balanced mixture of high streak and casino. And when, we got, when I was getting interested in this, I had got to know Mervyn King quite accidentally while I was chief scientist when we were appointing the new head of the Economic Social Research Council. And the committee was three civil servants, me as chief scientist and a token social scientist. Mm -hmm. And the three civil servants wanted one person and I and the chief and the token social scientist wanted another and wanted a different person, and we won the argument. And I thought, this is an unusually wise and skillful <laughs> social scientist. I'll have lunch with him. And it was Mervyn King when he was deputy governor. And so when I, we were doing this, I said, why don't we invite George Sugihara across and get together with Nim and talk about these things? And when I showed this, um, people were interested in it, even though they probably shouldn't have been, because I think it's a bit superficial, because that's the first I'd heard of the Glass-Steagall theorem. We went, Nim and Sujit and I immediately went on to do something <coughs> that's more complicated in various ways. And its main feature, first of all, it had different asset classes, but it was exploring the possibility that the main phenomenon in much of what unfolded was not simply the mechanics of what happened, but the general feeling of confidence that people had in it. As many of you know better than I, there's a lot of thought that it was more confidence failures than anything objectively real that was predominantly responsible for what happened. So how we went about doing this, and this was, I think, this was something that Nim did. We fir he first of all ca characterized the confidence at the level of the system by saying it was a product of a sort of solvency health and a liquidity health. Solvency health was the value of all the assets as a ratio to the initial value if something went wrong with the initial value, the value of one or more banks. And the liquidity health was the fraction of the interbank loans that were not withdrawn <coughs> through trying to meet a problem. And then you did a similar thing for the individual banks. You could give each of the individual banks a health, HI, that was the value of its, its assets to its, the initial value and the fraction of loans that the bank could settle immediately. So that's the analog of the system. And then we assumed that how we would take into account this miasmic concept of confidence, we'd say, two banks are interacting, I and J, and the health of I and times the health of J is less than 1 minus C, so if everything's confident, that won't happen and everybody's happy, but as confidence falls and key get, C gets smaller, that product is going to be more easily less than it, and the banks then turn their long loans into short loans. And if it's more severe than that, less than 1 minus C squared, which will always be less than 1 minus C, then both banks call in all loans, and then you, unra then you go forward and you simulate that. The, simplest sim sim the simplest simulation, I thought this might be a, this, this probably is a pointer. It probably was a pointer. Oh. God, what have I done? I've turned the whole thing off. Turned on again. Help. 
I should never have picked it up. Oh dear, I should never have picked it up. Well, there's a lesson there. I'm so sorry. Good, brilliant, thank you. I'm not going to touch it again. And this is basically running a simulation where we had a system like that with a bunch of banks and we let one of them uh, fail and it failed at that point. So one of them failed and then it was quite a while you had to go down to very low capital reserves before you got the next tranche failing. And when they did, things went quickly. But on the other hand, if you put in the confidence effects, once the first bank went down, it was quite likely that the whole system would go down and it really made a very big difference. Now, when we did that, we didn't really, uh, weren't really aware of any evidence that bore upon it. But in fact, Nim at that point had gone to Princeton and there's a very interesting uh, economist there called Shin, that some of you will undoubtedly know, who's somebody who's rather keen on data. And he had done a study of the quarterly change in assets and the quarterly change in equity and debt in Morgan Stanley. And it, there was a study from the first quarter of 1996 through to the second quarter of 2011. And what one is looking at is the quarterly change in the assets in unimaginable amounts and the quarterly change in debt and equity. And what the things tend to show is that the things that caused loss of confidence and the things that precipitated the worries we have were more the result of debt than equity. But to us, the interesting thing is, having never thought about anything this way, we could go back to the model, which was already defined, and there's nothing we could fiddle in it, to see if we asked this question of it, after an initial failure, what would it do? And what it did was that, which was rather reassuring. And what we're trying to do at the moment, uh, uh, this is a work in progress, that was the bottom left. Now we're trying to look at the top right, which was the euphoric part of the whole thing that built the bubble. And we're wanting to see if we can get a similar fit between a, a model akin to the other one and what the, that might tell us. Broadly, however, um, there are very simple messages that common sense tells you anyhow that emerge. This is a model that we did quite a lot of models with big banks and little banks, because that's what we've really got. We didn't do anything as extreme as the real banking system in America. The real banking system in America, 1.4% of all banks own 79% of all assets. It's a rather astonishing statistic, and I'm not sure I believe it. And we didn't do anything nearly as extreme as that. We, we, this is a system of 200 banks, and we've got big banks and little banks. The big banks, all the banks have the same individual size of loans, otherwise you couldn't connect them. It's just the big banks have more loans, and they all have the same number of assets. It's just the big banks have bigger chunks of them. And so we made, this is a figure where we made the big banks 25 times bigger. They each had 25 times the number of loans, and their assets were 25% bigger than the little banks. And then we asked, again, putting a shock into an index bank selected at random, either a little bank or a big bank, what would happen? To what extent might it cascade in terms of the capital reserves from 10% to 2% and reality sort of around there of for the big banks and the capital reserves for the little banks? And then there's an imaginary line going along there in the back. You could think where the big banks and the little banks hold the same magnitude capital reserves. But what this thing makes dramatically clear is that the big banks ought to be holding 
relatively bigger capital reserves. <coughs> and it, it really is a dramatic effect. And of course, as you know better than I do, what happened in the run-up to the crash was that the big banks were holding relatively smaller capital reserves because they wanted all their money working and they simply argued their reserves were bigger than the reserves of the little banks and that, so that was what they were being good enough and uh, there we were. The effect of a big bank, this is now, if, this, if at the bank that fails that you choose is a small one, in general, nothing much else happened. But if one of the big banks failed, uh, more, than, more as, as often as not, it brought the whole system down. So these are things that were sort of intuitively obvious anyhow. I'm going to conclude now. Um, talk, I, my allotted time, I've got uh, three minutes left, so I'll run over a little bit. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit about what are some of the things that one might be thinking about in regulatory measures. And the one, up, the one I've just discussed is up there now, and there doesn't really uh, seem to be a need to elaborate it. It's sort of obvious. Trickier is... Oh, sorry. I, this screen is very sophisticated. It gives me the actual slide and the next one. And I'm still uh, trying to adjust to it. I, so this is the thing I just meant to say I thought I was talking to. And... But that's an unambiguous sort of conclusion. Big banks should hold capital, bigger capital reserves. But then in relation to leverage limits, again, I'm just quoting Andy Haldane there. And again, it's interesting to look at some of the leverage limits that were run up in the crunch. This slide is the leverage is the y-axis, and across this way, um, one is looking at the, uh, the intensity of the rating downgrade uh, that the bank experienced. Blue is, uh, means very, you got off very well, and yellow is uh, it didn't get off very well at all. Uh, you might have thought it was red, and I'm not sure what the pink one is, but... Uh, it, it really does illustrate, in fact, uh, the, the size of the, uh, of the bubble was really quite astonishing. Um, I had a figure I, feel I can't find now for it, but it was uh, several multiples of, uh, of GDP. If, uh, in some of the att things attributed to it. I'm going to c conclude with recommending, oh, an another thing that is, I think, a valid connection with the things in e ecological systems, where it's very clear that all, both theoretically and experimentally, that systems that seem fairly robust are often organized in a modular way. So that if, if you go back to the stability matrix, it's not things were in random, but they were put in little packages and way, way back in the Paleozoic when I uh, had a graduate student, Ross McMurtry, who played with these sorts of things uh, to find what were the sorts of things that would help stabilize ecosystems, and that's one of them. And th that, again, that kind of modular organization brings us back to Glass-Steagall and things like it. Remind us again of this, but I wanted to end my uh, last slide, I highly recommend an article that Benjamin Friedman wrote in the bulletin that every spring the American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, publishes, and it was in 2011, I think, and it really is a splendid article. Um, for those not uh, thoroughly familiar with it, in, there are two older academies in the US when the two cultural capitals that competed with each other and each thought they were the cultural capital, capital were Philadelphia and Boston. And they each have an academy that still does interesting things, but they really 
uh, lost a lot of their grandeur when Lincoln rather unkindly created the National Academy of Sciences about 100 years later. Benjamin Friedan, or you can again read that, but it, I think that's a fascinating statistic that I haven't seen anybody else attempt to, to analyse. And I'm not myself sure exactly what is meant by the cost of running the financial system, but I think, of course, it's salaries, bonuses, and possibly also the uh, office space and stuff like that. But it's an astonishing statistic, um, the in that increase from 10 to 25% uh, to almost a third. I've finished. Thank you very much. So, we have time for some questions. Um, are there any questions around? Yes? So, to combine, um, Polly, you did not hear my talk this morning, um, where I tried to understand or uh, propose an explanation for the state of the world now, the crisis, and where did it come from? going back to 30, year, 30, 30 years in what I call the illusion in a perpetual money machine. So you have emphasized the instability in the network of banks, making analogies with ecology. Uh, but I think what could be uh, strengthened in this analysis is to embed the ecology analysis in the ecology of uh, the economy in the transition from a productivity growth until the 60s and you are fascinated by this curve of the change in the depth of UK, which in my framework is easily explained by the change from a productivity, uh, let's say, controlled economy to an economy which is growing essentially due to debts and due to banking and finance, as your last slide just illustrates, we, from 10% to 30%. So um, just uh, curious about your thought about this uh, broader embedding of the problem. Well, I, I shall certainly be interested in learning more about what you did, but uh, I will approach it, I have to tell you, from a sceptical point of view, because the fact that that thing, that ratio was roughly steady for a hundred years suggested that there was something sensible about it, and it seems to me that if you look into what was going on with the mispricing of these things, that what was really going on is that the, the really interesting question is the one that is asked right at the end of The Big Short. And anybody who hasn't read The Big Short by Michael Lewis should read it. It's a basically true story, a great read. A bunch of young people who saw that this, I mean, they, they shared Buffett's view, as it were, and, but they saw a great opportunity to get rich by taking a short position. Uh, unlike uh, whoever it was that uh, kept pushing these things on their clients and taking a short position. They weren't doing anything immoral. Uh, of this also, I'm recommending things to read. This, the immediate past month's New York Review of Books has a marvelous essay by a lawyer asking why aren't some of the people that caused this in jail? And going through the counter-arguments and demolishing them. Anyhow, the, the kids come at the, at the end, and they, they, they say, yeah, this is great, we've got maybe some money, and then, but were these people stupid, or were they crooks? And Vinnie says, most of them were stupid, but some of them were crooks, and the crooks tended to be higher up. <laughs> so I, my feeling is that the truth probably has elements of what you just said, but I can't avoid toying with the idea that a lot of the people knew what they were doing and were taking it to the bank and I see little evidence that we're going forward to do much about it. Oh, I had a, a quote that I don't have on a slide, incidentally, which I would inflict on you in this context. Um, Doyne mentioned Glass-Steagall and, uh, and Pages. Uh, it, one of Andy Haldane's, again, you must read this, Google this and get it. Andy Haldane has a paper called The 
uh, that's on the bank website called The Dog and the Frisbee. Hands up anyone who hasn't read it. You must. But uh, it's a great article, and it's, it basically is an argument against overcomplicating things. And why the dog and the frisbee's in it, he, sa he says, there's a recent study that says dogs catch frisbees better than people do because they don't over-intellectualise it. They just run at it and catch it. Anyhow, Glass-Steagall was 30, the legislation was 37 pages. Dodd-Frank is 848. Basel I was about 30 pages. Basel II was 347 pages. Basel III is a few thousand and counting. Uh, so th there's all sorts of... Within, once you've got that sort of thing happening, there's a lot of room for skullduggery. <laughs> okay. I'd like to see you at the end. Okay, the final question here. Bob, thank you very much indeed for that, and thank you for using the pigs from our, our paper. Mm. Um, I think there are two factors about the increase in bank balance sheets, and it would be very good to disentangle them. One I think is probably legitimate, which is the banks become more international. So, for example, when HSBC bought Midland Bank and then decided to relocate mm -hmm. in the UK, mm -hmm. the statistics show, OK, British bank balance sheet's gone up, but that's actually because it's providing genuine banking services in lots of other places. Mm -hmm. There was undoubtedly a second effect, which was some banks just swelling their balance sheets in a wholly unconscionable way. And, and maybe it would be possible to disentangle these two, yeah. because I, then I think we could put our finger that, more accurately on what's to, really yeah, wrong. Yeah, given that one is having to explain a fact of 16 growth, yeah. I, can, I, I have never thought of that, that as it becomes more international, then there's just basically more banks. <gasps> So, uh, and, and more activity because a lot of it is overseas. And so, but I can't, I can't see it being more than doubling it or tripling it or something. Sixteen times in it is a <laughs> Thank you very much for a stimulating f uh, finishing talk uh, for today. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs>